Hey everyone, welcome to Real Reflective Practice. I am Dr. Anjali Pereira, the Disillusioned Medic. And as always, this live stream is about having the meaningful and open conversations that we doctors don't always realize we crave. I hope you're all well. Um, I have had a bit of a day of it, actually. <laughs> My daughter has been really unwell. She had a fever. And so, of course, now we're isolating, um, trying to get tests, but not been able to get a test because obviously there's uh, more demand than supply. So it's all been a bit of a nightmare um, trying to juggle work and tag teaming with um, with her dad trying to get things done. So. It's been a bit of a day, <laughs> so I'm glad to be doing something tonight that I really enjoy. Um, and thank you, thank you for tuning in and for being here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you as well to everyone who watched uh, last week's live stream on respite. Uh, that was with um, Amandeep Sidhu from Doctors in Distress and Dr. Samantha Anthony, uh, who is the founder of the Permitted to Pause campaign. Um, it was it was such a brilliant show, and we talked about so many moving um, and important things. Um, and, and many of you got in touch afterwards to share your stories with me. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and, and please accept my apologies if I haven't replied to you yet. I am slowly working my way through all the messages. Um, so I will get there uh, and thank you again. Um, if you'd like to comment during the show tonight, um, feel free to pop your thoughts in the chat on the right hand side. Um, otherwise, you can get in touch on social media. I'm on Facebook and Twitter at DisillusionMed um, and you can email me as well at DrAngeliPereira uh, at gmail.com. So on to tonight's show. Our theme is culture. And I have an absolutely fabulous guest for you tonight. Um, to discuss it with me, I have Dr. Maria Padime, who you may know if you've read her book, Postmortem, The Doctor Who Walked Away. Fantastic read, I would recommend it. Um, she has also done an amazing TED talk um, and she's gonna be coming on a bit later to talk to me about that and to talk to me about this theme of culture. So I'm really excited about that. But to kick off, as usual, um, I would like to read out a reflection from Dr. Michael Sammy, who you might remember joined me for a reflective practice a few weeks back um, on the theme of creativity. It's quite a while back now, actually, <laughs> maybe a couple of months back even. Um, if you haven't seen that stream yet, check it out. It was a good one. Um, and, and Mike had a few thoughts to share about creativity as well, um, creativity in medical professionals. So I'd like to read them to you tonight as they're pretty interesting. Um, and I think they'll resonate with a lot of people. So in this reflection, uh, Mike references something that he was talking to me about during our live stream, which was the maker versus manager mindset. And he says, while we shouldn't forget that medicine is the right profession for many people, there is currently a huge exodus of doctors around the world from a profession they feel totally disillusioned with. As I mentioned in the stream, there are 16,000 members on just one of the alternative careers for doctors Facebook groups. Even if they aren't all jumping ship, it suggests there is a big problem in the medical profession. Every former medic I've met seems to be intensely creative and hardworking in their new occupations. I've met former doctors who are writers, bloggers, UX designers, web developers, data scientists, recruitment consultants serving former doctors, events people, a plethora of entrepreneurs. They were all creative enough to think laterally and reinvent their careers when they were unhappy in medicine. It has gone largely unaddressed that many doctors are likely to have the maker brain, the creative and curious approach to life, the kind of brain that can study for prolonged periods, the ability to close the door and hyper focus on what they're learning. But demands on doctors have increased and they have been forced to work in the manager style, that is to make lists, tackle problems with quick decisions, endure new tasks and distractions every five minutes on the wards, meet the quota for operations and clinic numbers, meet time limits, etc. Many of these people who in the right environment can produce really good work, find themselves totally burnt out because they have naturally creative, hyper-focusing, easily distractible, absent-minded professor brains that are tuned in for the details and doing one thing at a time. I've seen efforts to harness the skills of natural creatives of medicine, but they are all unpaid. If we valued and paid doctors who struggle with a hectic adrenaline fueled clinical life to be properly involved in creating new services, looking at new ways of running things and solving all sorts of logistical problems that exist in the NHS, 
Perhaps we'd retain more doctors and the NHS would join the fast growth we see in the tech industry. Mike, thank you uh, for that reflection. Um, and thank you again for joining me on that stream. Um, I love what you say about adequately compensating doctors for their creativity. Um, I mean, doctors and especially junior doctors are so conditioned to do things pro bono, right? I mean, you, you work free overtime, you you teach and train others for free, you, you may do research, quality improvement programs, projects. Um, you may even take part in clinical entrepreneurship programs. But, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, all of those things are unpaid. Um, we do them because we believe and we're told that, you know, we have to do them in order to progress and to make our CVs look good. But, you know, it, it, we're told that we're lucky to have these opportunities. And yet, while it's all well and good to volunteer, the problem with that attitude is that it inherently gives us this idea that creativity isn't something that's valuable or valued, you know, in the NHS. Um, I remember being so astonished when I left medicine that people were willing to hire me and pay me money <laughs> to, to for me to be creative. You know, they wanted my creativity. So I I couldn't imagine now working with anyone who didn't value that. So, um, so yeah, so thank you again, Mike. Um, and I'd love to know if you guys agree. Do you think that uh, doctors have a maker over manager mindset? Um, and is this driving people out of medicine? Send me your thoughts at dranjaliperera at gmail.com or on Facebook and Twitter, as I said, at DisillusionMed. So let's get our teeth now into this week's theme conversation, which is culture. So obviously we're going to be talking about workplace culture in medicine. Um, but what I was thinking about tonight for my story to tell you, you know, tonight was what came to my mind first really was, was not so much workplace culture. It was more about my cultural background more than anything. So I'd like to tell you a bit about that. I grew up in a Sri Lankan community. My parents are immigrants, um, as are a lot of my family and my family's friends. So a huge part of the backdrop of my childhood was this idea of the importance of culture. So many conversations were had in my house <laughs> around what it meant to be Sri Lankan. So many arguments uh, when I was a teenager began with something along the lines of, you should do this because it's part of our culture, uh, and you mustn't do that because it's not part of our culture. Um, and I think, you know, being immigrants played a huge part of this because you know, I can I can only imagine what it must have been like for my family to be so far away from home in an unfamiliar land um, and, you know, still want to instill those values and beliefs, you know, into your children and, and make sure they don't forget where they came from. Looking back on it now, it's interesting to think about the complexities of growing up between two different cultures. Um, the clashes between the two, the surprising overlaps, um, the frustrations of having to navigate two ideologies, the benefits of, you know, understanding two sometimes polar opposite views. It influenced the way that I think, um, it's influenced the way that I am. Uh, and, and there are a lot of things that perhaps I now question as an adult that as a child were just normal to me because that's just the way it was. I think part of growing up when you're a first or second generation immigrant is the process of deciding which parts of that culture you keep uh, and you might integrate into your identity and which parts you let go and move on from. And when I reflected on the culture of medicine, it struck me that when I left, there were so many things about being a doctor that I had just accepted as normal that the outside world from medicine would consider completely bizarre. Because just like when I was a child, that's just the way it was. But unlike my childhood, I'd never really had exposure to another culture. It was just purely medicine. All the jobs I'd had before medicine were either volunteering jobs or they were things like childcare, which is obviously vastly different from being in an adult workplace setting. I had nothing to compare my working culture to. And so now when medics reach out to me asking about career changes, I sometimes forget how deeply ingrained that culture can be. I'm so removed from it now that it's almost surprising to realize other people are still in that place 
where the culture of the medical profession is all they've ever known. And when that's the case, we don't get to choose which parts of those cultures, that culture we incorporate into our being and which parts just don't fit with who we are because we have nothing to replace the pieces that we discard. And I think that's the source of a lot of the distress that disillusioned medics feel when they start questioning their careers. It certainly was the case for me. So with that said, I'm going to bring on our guest for this evening. Um, Dr. Maria Padime is amazing. She has an incredibly impressive CV. She began as a doctor in South Africa, graduating from the University of Cape Town in 1999, and she's also had experience of working in the NHS. In 2004, however, she left the profession and she is now a writer, a coach, and an international speaker. Her award-winning memoir, Postmortem, The Doctor Who Walked Away, which is a book that I mentioned earlier, um, has inspired so many people um, and her inspiring TED talk as well on the same subject has been watched over 200,000 times and it's amazing. As a coach she now works with leaders and high achievers and she's even collaborated with the United Nations. Her story was definitely one of those that inspired me when I decided to leave medicine myself so I'm really really excited that she's here on the show with me tonight. She's joining us this evening all the way from South Africa so Maria welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Um, busy day, busy start to the week, but otherwise all well. Thank you. Brilliant. I'm so I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so happy to be connecting with you, actually. And I can't believe I'm actually talking to you because you know I first read your book and, and saw your talk so many years ago now. So so this is amazing. Um, and yeah, I can't, I can't wait to get our teeth into, into our subject tonight. Um, but yeah, Maria, yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Maria you, you talk in your book um, about the culture of the medical profession um, and uh, you know, what it was like when you were practicing and how aspects of that culture um, contributed really to your decision to leave. So it would be great to start by asking you what is culture? What what do you think of as culture? And really, why does this idea of culture mean so much to you now? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it was interesting hearing you talking about um, your culture from a background, you know, your Sri Lankan um, background, because that's essentially what culture is all about. It's the way we do things. We define ourselves as Sri Lankan, as South African, as whatever. And, and then we, we have a certain kind of way of doing that based on how we define ourselves. And certainly in medicine, um, there is very much a way of doing things. Um, and it was, you know, when I was practicing medicine, it 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 seemed normal and and as as you pointed out before i think when you're in it and you know you you start off and you're groomed from day 1 at med school you don't realize or you don't question much of what you're taught and for me i didn't question any of it you know it was well you know this is this is the track that i'm on uh, I want to do well, I want to graduate and, you know, serve and be a doctor, et cetera, et cetera. So it just felt normal. Um, and it was only when I was practicing medicine as a junior doctor, first in the UK and then when I came back to South Africa, that I started then questioning. And, and even then I didn't even... I didn't have the word culture, mm -hmm. right? I just, I didn't know, I didn't have that distinction. Let me put it that way. I just knew that there was something about the way that I was working that wasn't working for me, that didn't feel good for me. But unfortunately, at the time, I think I personalized it. I kind of said, well, there's something, there's something wrong with me. There's something that I'm not getting. There's, there's just... 
I, I, I suppose it's the, the loud inner critic in me that said there is something wrong with me, I'm not getting it right. And it was only really years later when I wrote my book and I was speaking to other doctors that I started realizing, that, oh, hang on a sec, this isn't just about me, this is way bigger than me. And that's when it clicked that there is something in medicine, there is something about the way we are trained, the way that we work, that leads to so much distress amongst doctors. Um, and sometimes it's it's kind of um, tolerable distress, but can often be, you know, burnout and outright disillusionment such that people like you and me decide to then walk away. Mm. No, I mean, it's, I resonate so much at everything that you said, you, you could have taken the words out of my mouth. I mean, it's, it's interesting mm to think about my experience of medical culture because just like you I didn't think of it as culture when I was living in it mm -hmm. um I mean obviously I, I knew as you said there were certain ways that doctors did things you know there were certain ways of being but I I didn't really think about it in the global sense that this is a system of beliefs it's a system mm -hmm. of behaviors um mm -hmm. and, and that, that I was a part of it and, and perhaps it had a larger impact on me than I realized you know mm -hmm. um and it, and it's like I was saying in my story when you're when you're constantly surrounded by something it's osmotic you know you absorb that mm. and particularly if you have no other input right so mm. you know you don't realize that things are perhaps strange to other people uh, and looking back now you know for me I I can see that so clearly um mm. and it's interesting to hear it from you as well that you felt you were almost almost blind to those elements of mm. culture um mm. And I, I know that, you know, now you you do a lot of work in the leadership space um, in that kind of sphere and, and culture is obviously very important there. So how does it feel knowing what you know now, you know, looking back with hindsight at, at your time as a medical professional? Well, um, in the work that I do as a coach and um, with, uh, you know, doing uh, leadership development work, I'm more conscious of how critical culture is to performance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I see it because I, I work um, as a coach, um, both with doctors as well as in the corporate sphere. And it's interesting for me to see how the, the culture that you and I were trained in is still very much entrenched and how it often holds people back. And to be able to then compare it with where what I'm seeing in the private sector, in the corporate world, is it's chalk and cheese. Mm. And it feels as if in medicine, there is, we're, we're kind of a few, many years back, you know, the, I think the, the commercial world um, realized a long time ago that, hang on a sec, the success of our enterprises depends on our people. And medicine hasn't joined those dots yet, um, I don't think. Um, so in, in the corporate world, there's an enormous amount of investment in people. There's an enormous amount of investment in how do we, you know, even exploring culture, you know, what's working, what's not working, how can we... Um, refine our culture or define a new way of doing things such that we get the kind of performance that we want. Whereas in medicine, it's almost, well, that's the way it's always been. And that's the, the way it will always be. You know, there's a, there's a resignation there. And we're not looking closely enough and saying, hang on a sec. Sure, that's the way it's always been. But what is the impact? Mm -hmm. Why is it that, you know, for me, I find it shocking, you know, working with, with um, coaching doctors, I find it sh shocking, and I suppose shocking yet not surprising, the, the levels of apathy, of disillusionment, of behavior that you think these aren't, this isn't, you know, the kinds of people who get into medical school to end up being the kinds of people who behave in, you know, un unproductive ways once they're working in, in the field, something happens 
between day one of med school and when you're out working medicine or in, in the hospital? What is going on there that has people underperform in that way? Um, and and it is it, it is a systemic issue, um, and that's where culture comes in. It's a it's a culture that is very much top down leadership because top, culture is really leaders are custodians of culture and they shape culture, right? So the leadership that we see a lot in medicine is top down, expert led, directive. You will do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved what you were saying earlier about your, your uh, previous conversation with Mike about the, the maker versus the, the manager. The culture in medicine does not enable maker thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I agree that a lot of doctors are makers, but it stifles, the culture stifles that capacity to be creative, to innovate, and so people just fall in line and do the job um, whilst so slowly shriveling up and the life force being sucked out of them day by day. Um, yeah, so I think we need to look at the impact. You know, culture, there's nothing wrong with culture. It's to what extent is the culture promoting what we want and to what extent is it actually causing harm? That's the critical question that we need to be asking. Mm, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting, actually, um, you know, this culture is this kind of, it's this nebulous thing that's, that's quite difficult to define. Um, and so it is almost impossible, and unless you've specifically looked at it, it's impossible to look at your surroundings and sort of pick out, this is the culture, and, and this is the reason why things are as they are. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if we can reflect a little bit on the constituents of the medical culture and, and what, what makes it, what, what is the thing that's, you know, that's causing that negative impact and that's pulling people back from, from their potential. Um, and, you know, I was, I was thinking about this myself a, a little bit earlier, and I, I think a, a big part of the medical culture for me that I found frustrating was sort of the hierarchical nature mm. of the profession you know there's a definite pecking order and if you're a junior you do what your consultant tells you mm. and obviously there are valid reasons for that um mm. from a medical point of view but I, I feel that creates this sense of a lack of autonomy right um mm. I, we, we all, all often hear about how junior doctors feel like sort of glorified clerks or or secretaries you know um and that definitely was the way i felt sometimes Mm -hmm. um you know, either I was following orders or I was following guidelines you know so you're kind of mm -hmm. just stuck in this cycle of just following and what somebody else is telling you to do and even when I tried to have different kinds of autonomy it, it didn't work out I mean I, I have told this story on the stream before but I I was mess president in my first year as a doctor um, and I ended up fighting with the deanery because they wanted to close our doctor's mess and, and give us this teeny tiny little room that was far away and just awful uh, and it got quite nasty like the, the dean said some pretty horrible things to me personally and this, this is the guy who's meant to be you know looking after the interests of junior mm. doctors mm. so I felt very much that any autonomy was not only frowned upon but actively stamped on um, mm. and, and that was very discouraging so yeah I mean that that definitely is an aspect of the culture that that lack of autonomy that hierarchy that that definitely mm -hmm. for me felt like a big piece of it um just mm -hmm. interested to know if, if you have any thoughts on on big pieces mm -hmm. that you kind of feel fit into that puzzle um fear mm. <laughs> of fear you know um and it being reinforced by behaviors such as bullying such as humiliating on ward rounds um, which is considered standard practice um, you know you're, you're earning your stripes if you can stand being humiliated on a ward round um, so very much um, fear-based kind of leadership mm -hmm. um, but again you know it's 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 so counterproductive because people who are fearful, our natural instinct as human beings is, is to protect ourselves, right? So we will protect ourselves either 
by shrinking and, and doing as little as possible. You know, if I can make myself small, then hopefully they won't see me and I won't have to absorb the onslaught. Or we we fight or we run away in some form. You know, the, the kind of um, fear responses are not what you want from a performance perspective in terms of delivery of quality healthcare. But it just doesn't, um, I suppose that there, there isn't enough of, a, of an awareness of how destructive fear is. It's mm -hmm. almost if the more people are scared of you as a senior doctor, the more things will get done or the more respect you earn, I, whatever the rationale is, but it's but it's very much that um that, that sense of leading um, by fear. You know, I remember a number of consultants, you know, you would, you could feel it, you know, someone would announce that so-and-so has walked into the ward and everyone sort of stands up straight and you can just feel the tension in the air. Um, and that is so, yeah, it, it doesn't produce results. Um, and we're not talking, you know, it's often when we talk about culture as well, we're, we're talking about, um, there's an element of well-being, and that's a that's a whole conversation in itself. But if we just talk about even just the nuts and bolts of what being a doctor is about, in terms of delivering quality care to patients, if we're just talking about that, if you really want to look after patients, you need to look after the people who are looking after the patients. Absolutely, and culture is critical to that, absolutely critical to that. Mm -hmm. And if um, it seems that the profession is is blind to that, that reality. No, I completely agree with you. And I, I really love what you what you say about, about fear having that impact um, mm -hmm. on the on the way that we we practice because I think a big part of fear, kind of something that stems off from that is is the culture of blame, you know, that, that we see in, in the medical profession. It's Certainly in the NHS, it's a huge problem. And I'm guessing mm. that in South Africa, it's oh, a problem yeah. as well. <laughs> mm. um, and, you know, you, you see it on a micro level. You see the pettiness with each other on the wards. You see kind of the microaggressions, passive aggressive threats, like mm. give me your name and grade so I can write it down. And so, you know, you, you, mm. you we know that you're the person who refused to see this patient and refused to do this, whatever. Um, and of course, this behavior is really unpleasant. But on a macro level, it can be actually life destroying. You know, we've, we've seen massive cases in this country go through the courts. Like, I don't know if you heard of Dr. Uh, Hadiza Bawagaba, um, mm. who was convicted of manslaughter for making a mistake that any doctor really could have made um, under the circumstances that she found herself in. Um, and then there was Dr. Chris Day as well, who's another case. Um, he, he's fighting for his medical license because he was a whistleblower, you know? So mm. this culture of, of scapegoating really and, and blame is, it's toxic for, for everyone on, on all levels. Um, mm. And I, I mean, did you, did you experience this blame culture yourself? And, and really, I mean, why, why do you think that happens? Um. No, I mean, not personally, but certainly with the the doctors that I coach now, I hear a lot of, of it coming through, you know, particularly doctors who are leaders, you know, heads of department and so on, you know, the, their challenges are people aren't taking responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. And my question is, how safe an environment are you creating for people to take responsibility. Because if people have been trained in a culture where you can't own up, you know, everybody makes mistakes. There isn't a, a single doctor in the world who's never made a mistake ever, right? But how you handle those mistakes determines whether people feel like they can, uh, they can own up to them in future or whether they can then blame somebody else for mm -hmm. those mistakes, right? So it's it's around to what extent is our culture one of safety, one of 
mistakes happen, let's learn. Put up your mm -hmm. hand, let's learn what happened, what can we do, perhaps it's a system thing, perhaps it's communication, whatever it is, let's learn, let's implement new ways of doing things and let's move on. Um, but if we're not, if people don't feel safe enough to do that, then they will, they will blame. They yeah. won't take responsibility. And at the end of the day, it's the patients who suffer. Because again, also, if you want to be growing and learning and innovating, you know, um, having worked with the NHS or in the NHS, I'm aware of the, the challenges that exist in, in your system. And having worked in the South African public health system is even way worse. So there are huge issues. Mm -hmm. The only way we're going to address those issues if we is if we are if there is an uh, an environment that enables us to look at what is wrong, what's not working, how can we do things differently? But that requires that people feel safe enough to have those ideas, to to have a voice. That it's not only the consultant who has a voice, but even the junior doctor, because the junior doctor works in that environment. And how can we create a, a, the psychological safety for everybody to feel that they can contribute and, and be heard? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I apologize, Maria. My, you heard my cat. Meowing yeah. in the back. <laughs> She's winding herself around my legs. I didn't even realize she was in here. She was hiding in a drawer. I'm going to go and let her out. I'll be back in two seconds. Don't worry about it. I, I really don't mind. Okay. <laughs> oh, the perils of working from home. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> anyway, back to our conversation for our feline yeah. interruption. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to ask you about your views about really is that the thing is these Maria, these are conversations that we've been having for years, right? We are aware of, of the deeply rooted systemic problems within healthcare systems and all the complexities around that mm. um, and, and how they impact, you know, individual judgments. Um, and, and yet so many doctors still shoulder that burden themselves. I mean, you mentioned it earlier. You talked about feeling like this is your fault, there's something wrong with you. Mm. Um, and, and then you spiral into this self-doubt and you know this this guilt and the shame as well over mistakes and issues that aren't wholly your own. Um, so so why do we do this as doctors? Why do we take the blame ourselves um, rather than questioning the negative workplace culture we work in? I think we don't. We often don't know better. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly didn't know better at the time. Um, and I think also the kinds of people who get into med school and pursue medicine are the kinds of people who are naturally <laughs> critical of themselves. Ten we tend to have a very loud inner critic. So it's, mm -hmm. I think it's part of our makeup that we have very high standards for ourselves. Um, and so when we feel like we're not meeting those standards, then we give ourselves a very hard time. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. Um, but I think as well, you know, again, coming back to that whole idea of culture defining how we do things, but also defines who we are, who, who we say we are, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, our identity is linked to the culture. Mm. And therefore, if I question the culture, I necessarily then have to question my identity. And where does that leave me? Ah, okay, all right, just carry on. Just, you know, put your head down, do the work, do as you're told, etc. So there's a lot, I think, that, um, yeah, a lot of identity linked to culture and I think that's why it's so difficult to to break it down because who do you become right mm -hmm. 
if you're if you're trying to redefine the way things are done, what then? Who who am I? Um, if I'm not part of this system of this very clearly defined path then who am I? What am I doing? You know, wh what is this? What does this mean um, in terms of how I, I identify myself? So I think it's, that's part of the reason why people cling on, even when there is a sense that uh, something's not right here, but it's, if I change it, what does that mean for me as mm -hmm. an individual? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, people, people in general are averse to change. And, yeah. and with traditions that have such long and deep roots as, as medical mm -hmm. traditions do, um, then challenge, challenging those is, is yes, is, it is extremely hard. And you know, I, I think for me, I never really, I mean, as I said before, I, I, I never really thought about culture um, until I left medicine. I don't think I really appreciated how much the responsibility of that culture is on the shoulders of leadership. And I, I loved what you said earlier about leaders mm -hmm. being custodians of culture. I think that's, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was so engaged, uh, disengaged rather, from from leadership in the NHS that I suppose that I didn't really believe perhaps that they had much of a role in creating or maintaining culture, um, which in, in itself, ironically, is a mark of poor culture because mm. employee engagement is obviously a, a hallmark of, of good culture. And I think it was yeah. Deloitte actually a few years ago that, that did some research around this and they highlighted that you know employee engagement and culture have a real impact, as you were mentioning earlier, on the success on the bottom line of businesses. Yeah. You know, and uh, things nowadays like the skills shortages we have, and we have greater workforce mobility, and we have employee retention issues, and so all of these things, of course, they have a financial impact. And I just, I just feel the medical profession is so naive to this, you know. Yeah. Uh, we have massive recruitment issues in the NHS, and I'm, I'm sure you have them too in South Africa. Yeah, you know, and massive retention problems, and all of this stuff costs money. So even mm -hmm. if you can't buy into the moral argument, there is a financial motivation <laughs> to address yeah. it. You know? and, yeah. and yet somehow, somehow this doesn't ever seem to be on the agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think... You know, part of it, when we start to talk about culture, I think it can be quite an intimidating conversation mm -hmm. because culture is so entrenched mm -hmm. and therefore it seems like in order to shift culture, we're going to have to do an enormous amount of work. It's, it feels too big. Mm. But I think really the way that we need to be looking at it is, yes, let's think big in terms of what we want to achieve, in terms of the, the new way of doing things, a more um, humane way of doing things in medicine, strangely <laughs> enough. Um, but let's start, so let's have the big picture, but let's start small. Let's start with a unit, a department, a team even, you know, so it's it, it doesn't need kind of the top decision makers in the health department to make those decisions. I think it's really about what can leaders do within their own teams and their own units and their own departments such that they start to shift the culture in, in, in their own space and then in time have those pockets of transformation start to, to coalesce and, and, and then result in a system change. But trying to change the system from the top down, I think people shy away from because it's such it looks like such a monumental task. I think a more um, doable, realistic approach is really to, to look from the bottom up in terms of small pockets and this that's really a big part of the work that I do with um, the my coaching clients who are doctors it's really looking at how can you do things differently in your team mm. um, how can you work differently with different departments in your hospital because again this interdepartmental rivalry wars silos 
you know, fighting is no, 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 our patient don't take, uh, you know, all of this, the nonsense that happens between departments, how can we start there? How can we think about collaborating in our own hospitals and therefore spreading the culture change in that way? Um, it'll take time, naturally, but it's taken a long time for the current, the prevailing culture to be established and entrenched so we need to just chip away, chip away, chip away, um, and and we'll get there. And it starts really with these conversations. It starts with highlighting, hey, guys, we know this is not working. Mm -hmm. We can make the change. Where is, look at your own sphere of control. What can you start to do differently such that you're producing different results? And then how can you start to spread the love so that more and more people are, are doing things differently? No, I, I love I love that concept because I mean we in the corporate world certainly we talk about you know culture being created from the top down um, and and it certainly makes sense in the corporate world but then for healthcare obviously it's hugely complex you know there are so many different I mean it's, it's so vast that it does seem overwhelming for leadership to be creating that culture not not that they shouldn't absolutely they should but this idea I really like this idea of creating pockets of of good culture um, and allowing those to kind of disseminate. Um, and I mean, it's it's interesting actually, what it makes me think about is this idea of collaborative culture really um, versus versus control culture, you know, the, the kind of authoritarian culture that we were talking a little bit about mm -hmm. earlier. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in this idea actually, because on the face of it, being a doctor, it's, it seems like it should be such a collaborative thing, right? You know, you're you're always working on a team in a team, yeah. and so much emphasis is is put on that teamwork. Um, but you know, when I was working for the NHS, it felt like it lacked collaboration. And I think mm. part of the issue for me was the fact that your team is always changing. You know, especially yeah. as a junior doctor, you're constantly mm. rotating around. You're moving to different wards, different hospitals you know, different parts of the country and sometimes even different countries. Um, mm. And even when you're in the middle of a rotation, you know, you, you don't always know who you're going to be on shift with. You know, there might be lump or there might be members of the team you don't know so well. Um, and, and any collaboration, therefore, is so short lived that, I mean, for me, I found it deeply lonely and unsatisfying. You know, you're, you're, you're constantly crossing paths with strangers um, and, and you're working with them in this very intense environment. And yet you're not forming these long term bonds and really understanding each other's ways of working, you know, each other's strengths and weaknesses, building those relationships. Um, and personally, for me, this is a really big reason that I left medicine because I hated that feeling of being solo all the time, you know? I, I, I mean, I'm aware that for some people that might not be such an issue, mm. or that maybe even that's a desirable thing for some people, but for me, um, you know, that, that was really, really difficult. And I suppose what it makes me think of is, I, I guess we have to remember that different cultures suit different people, you know? So one, one thing might work for me and, and not not work for, for somebody else. And I guess this is an argument to, a really good reason to get to know yourself really well um, and understand mm. sort of what working environments you personally thrive in, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I think we've got to, I mean, I think that's that's kind of at a, at a unit and perhaps at a hospital and department level. But I think we need to be, when you look at how many doctors are leaving, how many doctors are burned out and disillusioned? You've, we've got to be asking those questions around what is it in the system that is producing these outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to what extent is the culture contributing to these outcomes? So I think as much as, you know, and what can leaders, and when I say leaders, I'm not necessarily talking about the hospital CEO or, you know, at that level, but it's it's the consultant of a particular uh, department or, you know, so the leader of a clinical team, even if the people in the team change, the leader often 
you know, doesn't, so doesn't rotate elsewhere. But if the leader has a relationship or is collaborating, you know, a collaborative relationship with other leaders of other departments, then even if you're coming in for six months or however long you're there, you know that, oh, you know, I'm working in internal medicine, but we work really well with the surgeons and I know that I can call the orthopods and I won't be yelled at and et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? So it's, it's at that level, you know, the people, the leaders of those teams and of those departments, to what extent are they creating a collaborative culture such that even when people move in and out, there's a sense that, hey, guys, we're all in this together um, instead of what certainly exists in this country is the, the rivalries, the interdepartmental competition and fighting and toxicity, really, that often um, exists. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, it's... It's, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there are different pockets of leadership that can, can yeah. really influence culture. Um, a comment come through from Amandeep Sithu saying, very insightful discussion. Uh, deep thank, thank you so much, Amandeep, for, for commenting. Um, he, he was actually on uh, last week talking to me about the theme of respite. Um, and mm. seeing his comment reminds me, um, actually, I mean, that there is one good thing that we haven't mentioned yet about the culture of the medical profession. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are many good things, but one good thing that certainly stands out for me is that this, there is this sense of passion, this sense of purpose. You know, people are very driven by that that's internal mission of, you know, wanting to help people and wanting to make a difference. Um, and I think that is that is incredible. That's that's definitely yeah. a, a good part of the culture. But, um, and I'm going to put a negative spin on this, as I always do, but I think it needs to be said, <laughs> rather than appreciating this uh, and boosting this natural mm. tendency, I feel the goodwill of healthcare professionals um, is more from the not taken advantage of, you know, as we have seen mm. more than ever during this COVID pandemic. Um, and it's, it's such a missed opportunity, really, because we know that positive working environments boost productivity. I mean, we know that that's true. Um, and, and we know we've got this incredible resource of these incredibly dedicated people who want to make a better world, who want to make yeah. a better environment. So it seems such a, a shame, really, to, to let that go, you know, and, and to, not, to not use that properly, to, to misuse it, abuse it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. It's... You know, people who, by and large, people who choose medicine are intelligent, hardworking, big hearts, want to make a difference in the world. And to then not tap into that and in many ways crush that spirit is, is tragic. It really, really is tragic. And I think that's part of the what culture, the, the toxic culture can do is that it then leads to people who are just kind of ticking the boxes and doing the bare minimum just to survive because they're just so frazzled by the constant onslaught that they'll just do the, the bare minimum to, to get by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's, it, it's just so... It's so difficult then to do what you were talking about earlier, Maria, in, in terms of creating those pockets of positive culture. When you're so exhausted and you're so frazzled and you have 50 million things to do on your to-do list, um, to then start thinking about how to improve your workplace. Um, and, and even when you do do that, coming up against layers of bureaucracy and red tape and not being able to affect those changes, it's incredibly mm. frustrating. Um, and and yeah, so it's it's, hard the, the culture within itself it's self-perpetuating you know it's preventing mm -hmm. itself from changing um which is just it's so frustrating and uh this question from Amandeep saying um many doctors have an ego and crave status as a culture do you think that many doctors would still choose medicine if the title doctor wasn't a part of it oh that's really interesting that's a really interesting question. Mm. I mean, yeah. I mean, what do you think? I think, yeah, I mean, certainly medicine does, from the outside, 
<laughs> it <laughs> does still um, have that that status, that that prestige, you know, that nice title in front of your name. And I think part of what what comes as a disappointment is when you're on the inside is realizing that ah, uh -uh, that's all <laughs> that's all external gloss hiding <laughs> some really mucky stuff inside right I remember when I was first writing my book um, and I, I met up with a number of doctors and the one um, doctor said to me don't tell them you know don't don't share your story don't tell what it's really like because we want to maintain that veneer of you know, doctor, white coat, stethoscope, all of that status. Um, but so don't tell them that it's really, really rough on the inside. Um, so yeah, I think um, there, there is, there is a certain level of status and prestige. And, and I don't know about you, but many people have asked me, but oh, you gave up being a doctor? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like it's unthinkable. This is what everybody wants. We got into med school. You got this prestigious title. How could you possibly give it up? How could you let it um, go? Um, so I think perhaps if mm, it's an interesting question, um, I think we would lose some people or who who go who would go into medicine purely for status. Mm. But perhaps those are the people who cause most of the trouble, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the people who really are committed to making a difference, who really are committed to um, contributing, um, they would they would go for it anyway, you know. Um, it's interesting that you and I, you know, we – I left medicine, what, 15, 16 years ago. And my passion for making a difference hasn't hasn't waned. I still, I'm still there, you know. I, I'm still interested even in contributing to medicine, you know, mm -hmm. even after everything. So my heart is still in it. My heart is still in wanting to make a difference. And um, and I so I think that the profession would hold on to the people who are in it for the right reasons mm -hmm. and those who are in it for the status would find something else. So, so find something more lucrative. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really interesting that you, that you say that um, because I mean, for, for me, what, what came up wasn't so much um, kind of going in because it's lucrative going, going in for a certain sort of I mean yes yeah, social standing does come into it but from from my background coming from you know an Asian background Asian family where a lot of people are doctors where being a doctor is put on a pedestal you know so so highly it's the best thing we joke often that you know Asian parents tell their children you're either a doctor a lawyer an engineer or you're dead to me <laughs> Um, but I mean, I know it wasn't it was said in such explicit terms, but there definitely was this idea that medicine is the best, best, best thing you can do. Um, and so for for a, a young woman, you know, age 15, choosing my GCSEs, thinking, I don't really know what I want to do. I, I'm reasonably bright and I, I want to make a difference. And, and just seems like medicine is the thing that everybody talks about. You know, it's, just, it's the thing that you do when you're that kind of person who wants to help people. Mm. And like my journey out of medicine was definitely a process of realizing that there are lots of ways you can help people, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> lots of ways you can make a difference in the world. And the medicine doesn't necessarily suit everybody. Um, yeah. So I think perhaps there would be considerably fewer people who become doctors if you were to take away this glamour that surrounds it, um, purely because there'd be less pressure, you know, less pressure for people like me um, who, you know, perhaps medicine really, I mean, I don't think medicine ever suited me. It was never really the right decision. But people Ooh. like me who felt 
encouraged into it um if not pushed you know mm. um i think i think it would make a, a big difference not to have that kind of doctor title and status so so yeah it's interesting <laughs> mm. Mm. yeah interesting yeah i mean i think for me um i still think that medicine was the right thing for me yeah um and i think and this is of course with hindsight that my contribution to medicine is what I do now. My contribution to medicine is my book, my TED talk, the work that I do with doctors now. Um, yeah, so so for me, I feel like in a way I had to go through that that pain mm -hmm. in order and then to do the, the coaching and leadership development as preparation for or to equip me to be able to make the kinds of changes that need to happen in medicine. So I still feel that I'm I'm on track. I did a bit of a detour. <laughs> <laughs> I, took, I, I took the seat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's funny. <laughs> I'm still on track to, to make a difference in medicine, yeah. Oh, I love that. No, I, I think I feel the same way. I really do. I do yeah. feel the same way. I think I've done more for medicine with what I'm doing now than I ever did as a doctor. Yeah. Which is the funny mm -hmm. part of it. But yeah. um, but yeah, it's it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful talking to you, Maria. Thank you so, so much yeah. for coming on the show. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Oh, it's been lovely. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Mm. Um, if people want to get in touch with you um, after the show, how can they do that? Um, the best way to do that is to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, Dr. Maria Padime, and then to email me directly. It's maria at mariapadime.com. Fabulous. Well, I'm, well, thank you again for being such a fantastic guest and wish you good night. Um, and yeah, take care of yourself. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ah, oh, she's amazing. I'm so excited I got to talk to her. <laughs> I hope you love that too. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much for tuning in and for joining me tonight for another Real Reflective Practice. Come join the conversation on Twitter and Facebook at Disillusion Med. Um, and as always, do keep sending me your questions and your reflections to Dr. Anjali Pereira at gmail.com. I absolutely love receiving them. Join me for my next episode on Sunday, this time, this Sunday, uh, the 20th, September 20th, I will have a very special friend of mine on, Dr. Adam Harrison, who is also an ex-doctor uh, turned newly qualified coach. Um, we'll be broadcasting at 11 a.m. Um, it's The reason it's a kind of weird date and time is because he's joining me all the way from Australia. So there's an absolutely massive time difference. So, uh, so yeah, that's the reason it's on Sunday and that's the reason it's at 11 a.m. So I hope some of you can still join me then. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking about the theme of justice. So yeah, send me your thoughts about justice, that theme, any insights that you might have, any questions that you might have for Adam as well ahead of that show. Um, and until then, I will wish you all the very best. Thank you again. Stay inspired and 